Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Alex Alcoholic, um, day 17, and I am not a newcomer. I'm a retread, and... uh, so to qualify, I have four DUIs. I uh, spent 62 days in jail, drank every day uh, for about 25 years, um, except when I was in jail or pretty, and other than that, I pretty much every, every night I would get drunk. Um, I started smoking weed when I was 12 too, so I have a marijuana addiction as well. Um, and so my, my most recent drink is March 23rd, 2015. Um, that was the, uh, I got my uh, fourth DUI earlier in that month, or actually it was in February. Um, and it's, it, I'd already been to AA and it would stick like, you know, a couple of days at first, a couple of weeks. Alcohol was definitely, and marijuana, my solution to dealing with feelings, problems. So without really changing, I inevitably would just go back to drinking again, smoking weed too. I never never even really thought weed was a problem early on. Um, and uh, really it was like blowing up relationships was the worst thing for me hurting other people and just ending up alone. Um, I'm definitely a people person. I think I'm actually got probably CODA issues and other stuff there I'm looking at, but um, that's a different meeting. (laughs) So anyway, um, that March 23rd or that time, I I 100% knew alcohol was was a problem. so I, you know, got back to did 90 and I actually did more. I, I was not working. So I would go to like three meetings a day or anytime I wasn't, to, uh, you know, like anytime I, I wasn't working or didn't have something to do, I'd be in a meeting that kept me out of myself. It, it kept me from taking that first drink. Um, and, uh, so about, uh, Three, four months into that, I was actually going to go see the Grateful Dead for their last concert down in San, uh, where was it, Sunnyvale, I think, Cupertino. And uh, I, like, smoked pot. I was going down there with my my girlfriend at the time, and I had a total panic attack, and it wasn't fun anymore. So after that, I I just was like, all right, I'm going to try to just not smoke weed one day at a time and see how it goes. Um, and so that stuck and that my girlfriend left me again and I just threw myself in the program and, uh, definitely went every day. Finally, things started getting better again. I, uh, got a new girlfriend or got a new job, got, it got to be like a year into the program and, uh, it was like, okay, I can have a girlfriend again. And so I got into a, a relationship with someone in the program and things were going good. It was rocky. She's a lot younger than me. She was in her like four months in. we both talked to our sponsors and, you know, they were like, Oh, we're not going to tell you what to do, but you know, they basically didn't tell us no. So, uh, and, uh, so it's uh, things got better for me and I, started having a reservation or I had a reservation around marijuana that maybe I can smoke pot and it's legal now, all these rationalizations. Well, I, I honestly, I didn't know. I was hoping that I could just smoke pot and basically got into it and right back to doing it every day. So to make a long story short on that, my you know life the world fell apart again. Um, lost my job again, relationship blew up again. And so, you know, now I'm back. Um, and I can at least cross marijuana off my list. I know for me, it's, it does the same thing as alcohol in terms of 
getting me into my selfishness and just not thinking about other people. Um, I had never really worked my resentments either. So I had worked all the way through the steps. Didn't really do my resentments. I did the ones that were easy and my sponsor's like, Oh, I'll just come back to the other ones. Um, and so basically, you know, life fell apart again. And so I can cross pot off the list. It's with alcohol. I know for myself, any mind altering chemicals, you know, I mean, I, I'll use anything to get out of self. I'll use video games, TV. Right now, it's like, you know, it's better than than drinking or using. So, but I'm still trying to really make myself go to meetings, like at least one a day. And now I'm back to working with my sponsor again, back on step four, um, you know, going, just beginning doing my resentment list again. And I'm, I'm making a... I just I, I realize now it's I can't get around this. There's no shortcuts for me. I have to I have to do the work. Otherwise, I'm going to keep getting, or I'm just not going to get out of my selfish nature, my self-seeking nature. Um, so, I have a 22 year old son that you know through the program he's actually come back. We I destroyed that relation, or damaged that relationship also. But you know through even the 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 progress I've made so far, my relationship with him is better. We're back to being able to say, I love you. Like he'll say it back now, which, uh, that's, you know, I, again, I'm being selfish, but here I am. Uh, and, uh, my father is a Trump supporter. I had gotten into major, major issues with him. Um, I, and uh, I hadn't talked to him in over two years. Uh, I went back out there. Uh, he lives in Texas. Last Wednesday, I went to Texas. And uh, he's 82 years old, too. And uh, so I was able to just go out there and just be a, like, I love you, Dad. Be a son. Keep it simple. And I, it's like, I know he, if, if he saw the world the way I did, he wouldn't be the way he is toward me and vice versa if I saw the way of the world he does. So just getting more understanding towards others, uh, trying to not beat, beat myself up for, you know, my relapse. And I, I, I do look at it as valuable that I honestly did have a reservation. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I tested it out. The big book does say if you have a reservation, go out and have a drink, see if you can control it. I, I cannot control it. It's, it gets me back to the same level of being alone. Everyone doesn't want to talk to me except for you guys. And, uh, and I deserve it because I'm, I'm hurting people. So the blueprint for living, I definitely need. And uh, so, so today it's, you know, keep it simple, get up and eat. Got the two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> and uh you know, do my best to work the program and just keep going forward, you know, no matter what, one day at a time, you know, don't drink, don't pick up any other mind altering chemical. And uh, I'm also, you know, back trying to meditate more, reading spiritual books and uh, just trying to keep it simple. So, I mean, I, uh, I think I'm just going to cut it off there. So, Thank you very much for uh, asking me to speak, John. And, uh, you know, thank you guys for all your service and keeping the doors open. All right. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Rena. I'm an alcoholic um, from L.A., or I guess I live in L.A. now, but I'm from the Bay Area. I was born and raised in San Francisco. Um, so it's, but I moved to LA like seven or eight years ago to, to get, to get sober. So I don't usually speak at AA meetings either virtually or physically in, um, in person up there. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of a trip for me because that's where I did, uh, that's where I did all my damage. So anyway, let me just say, John, thank you so much for asking me to talk. Um, I'm going to tell a little, a little story about John, although, um, and, and when we met in Oakland in a little, I was in treatment, he was maybe coming back for an alumni meeting. This has got to be like, what, like a decade ago, more. 
Um, you know, it's an honor. It is always an honor and a privilege to speak on behalf of Alcoholics Anonymous. It really is. I'll give you some stats just so you can judge me appropriately before I delve into what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Oh, let me give a little shout out to my, uh, to my sponsee Fallon for jumping on this zoom, um, and, and coming to hear me speak for 40 minutes. I don't know what is going to happen, but I will do my best, um, for you guys. Um, you know, usually I have some key target bullet points to get through, but I'm going to have to just kind of go rogue off that script in order to fill up that time. And frankly, like, you know, everyone just bear with me. We'll just see if God's got something super exciting in store or maybe nothing. You know, that's the way uh, sometimes the cards get dealt that way. Anyway, Fallon, thanks for jumping on here. John, thank you for asking me to speak. And um, I'm just glad you guys are here with me tonight. Um, so, yeah, met met John. Um, I was in this treatment center up in some Oakland hospital. It was my first treatment center, um, you know, in... Um, and, and it had to have been more than a decade ago, which is crazy. Um, I'm, a, like I said, my name is Rena. I'm an alcoholic and, um, you know, I'm five and a half years sober. I'm uh, 32 years old. I, um, moved to LA, like I said, seven and a half, maybe eight years ago to get sober. And I met John when I was in my first 28 day spin dry more than 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. So the reason that I give you those numbers is to show you that there's some discrepancies there, um, to show you that when I say that my adult life has been defined by my struggle with both alcoholism and sobriety, I'm not exaggerating. Um, and, um, so if, if people are new, welcome, if people are come back, coming back, like welcome even more profoundly. Cause that, um, my experience was that I wasn't a, um, rocket to start up here in this program. You know, it took me a really long time to understand what it meant to have earned my seat here and then do the work to keep it. So born and raised in San Francisco, I always say that at the beginning of my shares, um, it's, it's less relevant up here. I like to say it when I share in LA because I want them to know that despite the fact that I live there, I'm not from there. Okay. I want to make sure that they know that. Um, I don't think they care, but, um, I, you know, my ego persists. I, um, I, uh, always say that, um, that that's where I was from. I like to represent that, um, I, that, 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 that my life was sort of defined by a great paradox. Right. And by that, I mean, you know, I was, um, born with really everything I needed to survive, like, you know, parents that loved each other and loved me and my brother, um, food on the table, shelter, um, bed, you know, all of that. And an emphasis on education, love, um, you know, and at the same time, I believe that I was also born with, um, with a pretty aggressive, gnarly case of alcoholism. And um, by that, I mean the obsession of the mind, a physical allergy to alcohol and drugs, and um, ultimately the spiritual malady, which, which we get to treat here. I, um, I was a sensitive kid. I was a sensitive and confrontational adolescent. Um, I felt like the world or I felt like life on life's terms was both too much and not enough at the same time, you know, I, um, and I felt like I needed to treat that with drugs and alcohol. And I did, I started pretty early, you know, I, um, I didn't have a ton of consequences in, in high school, but I knew that, um, I still knew that something was amiss, right? There was something like just, I could tell from very early on, like there was something amiss with the way that I drank alcohol. Um, so I didn't drink it very much in high school. I, I, but I remember I drank it, you know, I, I would like go to a school dance and then all of a sudden I couldn't remember like the next morning, I couldn't remember like the last two hours of the school dance. I didn't like that. Right. I didn't like it because, because in addition to being an alcoholic, I'm also a people pleaser and a control freak. And I want to be able to control and manage your perception of me. And it's just hard to do when you're blacked out. So I knew something was up, but I couldn't exactly, you know, I didn't have any language to, to figure out what the problem was. And, 
Um, I, after high school, I moved to New York and did a year of college in New York. And, um, that's when my drinking really took off. And that's when I really realized that I was bodily and different, uh, bodily and mentally different from my fellows. And I very remember, and poor Fallon, man, poor Fallon has heard some of these stories like 15 times, but she hangs in there because, you know, she's because she wants what I have, you know? Um, I, um, I, I, I remember that, you know, we were in our dorm and we had this dorm on, on 16th Avenue in Union Square West. And, um, you know, I thought I was way cool. And um, I, we were doing what kids do, which meant we were drinking in the dorm and someone was pouring shots and there was this girl from down the hall and she, we were going shot for shot. You know, someone had, had uh, passed her her second or third it must have been her third shot of the night I guess and um I remember you know the guy just kind of casually passed her and she waved it away and she said no no I'm good right here I looked at her I'm good right here I just didn't understand but like check it out I'd been in college for a couple of months now and some things were starting to happen as a result of my binge drinking and my blocking out some consequences that I wasn't super into right like waking up in beds with people I didn't know I was scared apparently like I would do things like run out in the middle of traffic people thought this was really a bummer to deal with on everyone's just trying to have a good time um and, and so I drank sometimes, like sometimes, you know, after a few months, I'd start going into drinking with this idea of like, I'm going to do it right. You know, I'm going to figure this out. Um, and, um, and so I saw this girl just casually turn down the shot. She was already like too deep. And she said, no, no, I'm good right here. And I thought to myself, where is that? Where is right here? I'm good right here. And I thought, how does she, how does she know that? right? How did she know that? And what, how was she able to say no? Spoiler alert to all of you who might be new and not know what AA, the AA program is about. It's not a place to teach you exactly where right here is and how to stay there. I thought it was in the beginning. I was uh, disillusioned of that fact, but spoiler alert, I never found out how to say, no, I'm good right here. I just, um, it wasn't available in my experience, it just, it wasn't available to an alcoholic of my type. Um, you know, but I did, I had many, many moments of that over many moments of that over that year where I recognized that, you know, um, I really recognized that something was very different with the way that I used drugs and alcohol than the people around me. And I just didn't know what that was about, but I knew that the consequences, the, the small ones, the college ones, you know, they were starting to pile up. Um, I, um, I, uh, what happened? This is going to happen a lot. I'm sorry. We're going to get back on track in just a second. Let me just, let me just ramble along a minute before I can, while I find my train of thought and we'll just get back there. So, um, so I know you'll hear speakers talk about this progression, the progression of alcoholism that talks about, um, you know, when you drink at first you have fun. And then you have fun with problems. Um, and then you just have problems. And um, I really, I really can honestly say that just the nature of the progression of my disease was that it was, you know, it was just a little accelerated. I skipped fun altogether. I ran on fun with problems for, you know, a couple years. And um, ultimately what happened pretty quickly is that, um, you know, I was just left with some very pretty serious problems that I didn't know how to solve on my own. So, uh, what ended up happening after that year of college in New York is that I knew is that, like I said, I knew something was wrong. I left college. I dropped out. I moved back to San Francisco. Um, you know, I got a job, um, John will remember some of this story, I think, but like, I got a job, like slang in, uh, sandwiches at a deli in, um, the Tenderloin. And I started going to city college. Um, it, but I was seriously, I was like the cashier. I wasn't, I thought I, I couldn't even, I wasn't even making the sandwiches. I was just the cashier, right? I was just ringing them up. But what I was also doing was getting paid in cash tips and walking around the corner um, and learning how to like, you know, uh, be an alcoholic on my own, not in a college setting. I was really just an, an alcoholic entrepreneur 
if you will. And by that, I mean, I was, um, you know, buying Oxycontin off the street. And um, that was sort of, there was something about that particular, you know, alcohol, uh, opiate cocktail that appealed to me specifically, my chemistry, one might say. Um, and partly I think that that is, and I will say like my sponsor, uh, my sponsor likes to say that I treated my alcoholism with a heroin addiction, um, which I think is sort of the best way to describe it. <laughs> um, because it's true that I actually, I didn't like the blacking out. It put me at too much risk. I, um, I liked at least, you know, with an opiate, you could just stay in the house, right? You were just like in the house and that was safer. Um, because a lot of things happens when you're a young woman and you're sort of out there, right? Um, we, the alcoholic life seems the only normal one. We become, I should just speak in the eye. Like it was really important for me to, as an alcoholic, carve out a, a sort of measure of, of safety. And for me, that was, you know, this co-occurring thing that was going on. So I know this is a meaning of Alcoholics Anonymous and I, um, am respectful of our traditions, but that's just, you know, that was my experience. Um, you know, pretty soon after, after sort of develop, pretty soon after moving home and, um, and my alcoholism taking off in San Francisco, um, you know, I walked into my parents' house one day and, um, and my dad was, he was always kind of like a tough guy, like a big guy, but he was in bed. It was the middle of the day. And I can't tell you exactly what I was doing there. I don't think I was quite living there at the time, but, um, I, I, he was in bed and he couldn't, he was having a hard time catching his breath. And, um, I remember, um, I remember that I, that I knew something was really wrong with the way that he was, um, not able to communicate with me. And so ultimately, well, I'll be honest. I was going to say like, so then I called the ambulance, but no, I called my mom because when I'm in trouble, I have the luxury of calling my mother, which I've done many a times before she stopped answering the phone. But in that moment, I called my mom and she said, what are you doing? Um, you know, call an ambulance, just another example of how like, you know, adulthood is a little bit, was certainly a little bit beyond me. I didn't, I was unable to handle life. Right. So you see a very sick, uh, person in bed. I didn't know what to like, just completely ill-equipped um, baffled. Um, my mom said, call an ambulance. I called the ambulance. Um, the ambulance came to get my dad. He, um, I, I followed in the car. I followed in my car. I remember that I arrived at the ambulance and they were taking him back to the ICU and, um, then they were wheeling him through the double doors and the nurse, um, turned around just before they were about to push him through and handed me his personal effects. And, um, you know, I, you'll hear speakers also talk from the podium about sort of getting to that point in their addiction where, um, they didn't care, you know, they were kind of beyond, um, caring. And, you know, my experience was never that I didn't care. I just, I've never related to that. I always cared. I always had the best intentions. I wanted to be the best daughter, the best sister, employee, student, whatever I had, um, I had, um, I always meant well, you know, um, but so what I meant to do that day that the nurse turned around and handed me his personal effects for safe keeping is sit by his bedside and wait for my mother and my other family members to, um, to arrive at the hospital. But what I did instead was, um, was that I accepted those personal effects and with them was my father's wallet. And the fact was that this um, day that I'd been going over to my parents' house, I'd been going over to steal a few bucks to, to get a morning fix. And, um, and so I was sick. I was sick by the time my nurse hands me this wallet. And, um, and though I meant to stay by his bed, what I did instead was I took the cash in his wallet and I took his debit card and I drank his account for as much as I could. And like I left and in many ways I didn't come back for a lot of years. Right. 
that's how I usually say it in my 20 minutes. Thank you. I see that trusted servant, um, my girl over there. Um, I, um, in many ways, I didn't come back for, for years is how I, is how I condense this period of time usually in my talk. Um, and, um, but what I'll say is as a result of me being gone, both that day and the weeks that followed and the months that followed is that I was the only one not there. Uh, my father went in the hospital. He never came out. I was the only one not there when he passed away. And I ran from that fact and got loaded behind that fact for a lot of years. Um, and I had a lot of shame around that fact because I loved that man. And, um, and that's when I landed. So my, my father died, um, in 2009. Okay. So my father died and seven and I get caught, um, drinking, using drugs, shooting heroin at my father's memorial. Um, and then seven days later, I'm in my first treatment center and, um, I start realizing what it means to be, uh, you know, not what it means to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but what it means to be an alcoholic. And I learned that I have um, a spiritual malady and an obsession of the mind that essentially I like the effect produced by drugs and alcohol and that I will do anything um, to produce that effect over and over again until, you know, physiologically, I have no choice to. Um, and I start learning what that means. That rehab doesn't take, John can tell you that. I think, uh, I think for a while after that rehab didn't take, I pretended to be sober and kept coming around. And, um, you know, so if you've ever lied in Alcoholics Anonymous, like, welcome. <laughs> you still have a seat here. I've done it. I was like nodding out in the back of rooms. Like, no, no, I'm sober. I'm cool. It's fine. Um, this is, this isn't what sobriety looks like on you. I wasn't ready for what you guys were I wasn't ready for what you guys were selling. I really wasn't like, I just wasn't, um, I don't know how to explain it. I just wasn't, wasn't ready. And like some of us that have had that have had that experience of not being ready, we know what that means. If you're new and you don't know if that ready, not ready, like what that means, don't worry about it. It's not important. You're here now and you're here tonight. I used to trip up on that. Am I ready? Am I willing? Am I willing to go to any lengths? Like, you know, let me check in with myself. Don't worry about that. Just um, be here and take suggestions. Um, you, especially, oh, what about this question? Are you done? Are you really done? You don't have to answer it. You just have to be here and work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, um, you know, after my father died, I um, and I went to treatment that first time, and that treatment didn't take. That sort of opened me up onto like uh, there was like a few years merry-go-round of that. You know, a couple years of running where the consequences would get worse if I thought I was tough when I was twenty and I had just started. Like, you know, I just had no idea the depths to which my alcoholism and my disease would take me. I just didn't know. Um, I got in, you know, three years later, I, it's the same, it's the same game. I, um, you know, this time all of a sudden, like things are getting much worse, meaning like I'm 24 years old and, um, I start getting really sick and, um, you know, it turns out I have a staph infection on my heart valve. Um, I, 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 and and every time something like this would happen, right? I would go, I would do a few nights in jail or, um, you know, I would, over, there would be something, you know, there would be something that should have indicated to me that like, um, that like I was really in trouble, right? Um, and I would feel it. I would feel it. I would be devastated by it. I truly would. I would be profoundly affected by the way that my, parents had planned for my life to go in the way that I was taking it, uh, for the opportunities that I was given and what I was doing with those opportunities. And I would be super sad about it, but I wouldn't take any different actions and I wouldn't, um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't change the course of my addiction. Right. Um, no fraud, the emotional appeal will suffice and no human power. Um, when I got 
when I started coming around to these rooms, I wasn't big on the concept of God. It just wasn't interesting to me. I, I, I didn't have a big, I, I, I just, it wasn't interesting to me. And, um, and I can look back and I still don't have a firm or solid concept of God, but, um, I can say that I can look back and, um, I couldn't have done it at the time, but there were divine, divine moments where willingness and grace sort of came together and there was an opportunity and things were presented to me and they happened and, and, and I can look back and I can identify those moments. Um, you know, and one of them was, um, when I finally, when I finally agreed to leave the Bay area, I needed a, you know, I went into a year long program down in LA and, um, and that program saved my life. I, I, um, that program saved me life and it saved my life and it didn't give me long-term sobriety. So let's talk about how that can happen. Let's talk about how sometimes like what Alex was talking about in his 10 minute talk, which was amazing, by the way, thank you so much. Like, but talking about that experience of like, um, you know, we had that, we, sometimes we needed a little bit more information, you know? And the fact is, as long as we made it back into these rooms, that time sober isn't lost just because we went out, we have a little bit more information and we have the knowledge that we kept. Like I tell my sponsor Fallon, you know, just because you, just because you relapse doesn't mean I get to, doesn't mean I'm, I'm, um, going to expect newcomer behavior from you. Right. We have tools. We just need to continue to put, pick them up when we're in these rooms. I, um, by age 24, I'm in this program and um, it's introduced me to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And on top of that, it's containing me in a way that I need containment. And on top of that, it's teaching me a few life skills that I managed to miss when I was out there running around doing God knows what, right? Because at this point, my friends have graduated from college like years before and I don't even have, you know, uh, I have a lot of withdrawals and no college degree to my name, no, um, no employment to speak of and really no accomplishments. Right. Um, really like I, I wasn't even, um, like basic per personal hygiene and like how to dress myself and how to present myself was also like, it was complicated. Like I needed people to break that down for me in the beginning. And they did. Thank God they did. Um, I was overwhelmed by the love that I found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I wasn't like stoked on it. You know, I wasn't like, yay, um, all these people are here to help me and they're super into me and I'm super into them. I was really disappointed that um, at age 24, 25, I had ended up in AA and it seemed like um, despite the fact that I didn't want to be part of AA, AA was the only place that wanted me to be a part of it. And that was only like neutrally. It wasn't like, they were like, Reno, oh my God, join us. They were just like, you can be here. Um, just like take some direction. And, um, and you know, that first, after that program and I moved out of that program and I was able to put together 22 months. 22 months of sobriety and and that was the longest that I'd ever put together and I was really proud of it and in those 22 months I was able to taste like a little bit of the joy that we find here where I got a sponsor I started working steps I did a very I did a fourth step that was as thorough as I could have been at the time meaning like you know I I, I didn't even know you know I didn't even know what we were looking for I did the best that I could um you know, but there were a few things that I wasn't willing to do in that first sobriety. Like people told me to um, get women's numbers and to call them and to tell them what was going on with me. And, um, you know, if I needed help to ask for it, it's stupid, I'm not going to do that. Right. Like I don't, I didn't want to do that. Like they, I had just been running around endocarditis jail, like, to, you know, to, the word just uh, for years. And like, now you're telling me that I'm going to come into the room and call women. I'm going to tell them how I feel. And I'm going to tell them that I need help. And like, you know, ask them for it. That just seemed really risky. It seemed like a tall order for someone like me. And it was, and it was. So that meant that like when that other area that I'd been hoarding and refusing to give over to God or to my sponsor to manage that area that like so often takes so many of us out, right? That like, I'm, you know, no, no, I, I'll, I'll take your direction around the not drinking and using, but I'm going to date who I want to date that area. 
um, when that area came calling and I had not yet done the work to, to feel comfortable enough to call women and ask for feedback and ask for help. And I, you know, like I was against defense. I was against defense. I managed to, in my sobriety that I was enjoying, right. I was like waitressing. I had a little like thing going. I was like, you know, kind of looked like a normal person again. Like I was against, uh, I was without defense against the first drink and, um, and in 2015, I got loaded uh, for the last time, and and it lasted a month, and I was no longer set up for the chaos of that life. I really wasn't like it, and it was like so quick back to like what it was like because, of course, because I'd been unwilling to turn over the area of who I did it. I was dating the same type of person, which means we like to get high the same way, and we like to drink alcohol the same way. So, like, all of a sudden, we're in a motel, and he's got knuckle tattoos, and we're just like, and I'm looking around, like, how did this happen? I had a good thing though, and I had been. I had had just a little bit of a uh, taste of sort of that, that the, the freedom that the third step gives you when you just start depending on a power greater than yourself. Um, I had just started really getting into that. And all of a sudden here I am, there I am. And it starts all over again, you know, um, because I'd done just enough work in that first. And this is another reason that I don't believe any time. I, I don't believe any time's wasted in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is wasted. Um, a fellowship had sprung up, had sprung up around me, um, by the time that I got loaded that last time. And, um, you know, I didn't want to come back. I thought that I had been, I had been the case that proved that AA didn't work. Um, but no one was really trying to hear me and in my research and like my PhD, uh, studies, no one thought it was like particularly compelling evidence. So they put me back in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and kicking and screaming like I sat in them um, as a newcomer yet again for what felt like the millionth time. And um, I was pissed and um, not very gracious and certainly not grateful one bit. I thought probably being born with, um, you know, with alcoholism was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. And um, and I was pissed, but I, but for, you know, but I sat there, right? And, um, I'm so grateful. Like my sponsor likes to talk, but likes to, and my sponsor will tell you, my sponsor likes to tell people that I have a bad attitude, right? That in general, I like hate everything and have a bad attitude, like on the natch. I'm just not that pleasant. And she's not like, she's not like wrong, you know? So like, I'm just, the reason that I bring that up is that I'm grateful that this is a program of action, meaning the, the feelings and the sentiment that I have around whatever direction I was going to, oh, I'm sorry, you want me to get my, on my knees? in the morning, like praying, standing up doesn't work. You want me to get on my knees and pray? Like, I think that's stupid. I think it's stupid. I think a lot of the directions that I've been giving alcohol, because I think they're stupid. If I take the action, I still reap the benefits. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I still reap the benefits, right? I am very grateful that you don't have to be a, an, a good girl in Alcoholics Anonymous feeling good about everything your sponsor tells you to do and telling people how good it is to still reap the reward. All I have to do is do it and I can do it kicking and screaming. And for the last five and a half years, for the most part, I have, you know, slow variety, they call it. Um, I, um, I, um, it was very important to me that I do, that, that I do every, that I do everything that I could, um, that I'd take every direction that was given to me because when I got loaded again, I want, I wanted my evidence to be foolproof. That meant that I called women every day. I called women. I didn't know. I asked them how they were doing. I did crazy things like you guys don't live in LA, but I would drive from like Marina Del Rey to like the Hollywood Hills to pick up me girl to go to a meeting. And we're talking like 17 hours of driving a night in service of Alcoholics Anonymous is what I felt like. Um, I did ridiculous things to prove that this program didn't work. And five and a half years later, I'm, I'm sitting here and, and I'm sober. You know, there was a lot of fear that I had to walk through. I was so scared. I was so scared of everything. I, um, I had, I, I was like a smart ass and I talked really tough because at the end of the day, like I was just so frightened of the world and frightened of being incompetent in the world. Um, I, I went back to college. 
um, to finish it. And um, you know, and I did, I just, I, one step at a time, I did what I wanted to do in this program, right? I had, I, my transcripts were a mess. I went back to community college to just stabilize them. Um, I transferred to a four-year, I finished that four-year um, while working. And then, you know, I, um, And it was, I, you know, and I didn't know what to do. I never knew what to do. So if you, if, I, if you're sitting in this room with a little bit of sober time and you don't know what to do, you're in good company. I never knew what to do. I was finishing up this college degree and I asked my sponsor what I was going to do next. And she said, why don't, because now at this point I have about three years, she was like, you know, this is crazy, but why don't you pray about it? why don't you continue to expand and enlarge your spiritual life? And I thought that was stupid, right? Um, I think that everything she says is stupid, but I, um, but I understood what she meant. Um, and what she meant was that I'm someone that's still in this program. Like I like to take my will back. I like to think that I'm in control than more than I am. I like to think that my obsessive thoughts can actually help outcomes manifest in real life. And it turns out that none of them are true. And the reason that I bring that up is because when, um, because in my experience being sober and in this program, whatever higher power that exists out there in the universe always has a better plan in store for me than I do. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do after I finished my undergrad and, um, I got really quiet and I prayed about it. And, um, and a few, a few weeks after starting sort of this very specific third step work around this, like, what am I going to do at this next part of my life moment? I, um, a professor approached me and she asked about my post-grad plans. And I said, I, you know, frankly, I wasn't that sure. And she asked me if I'd like to be a teaching fellow and teach an undergrad college course while getting my master's degree. Thank you, trusted servant. I see that. Um, so I did that. I did that. I entered that program and I was scared. And I was scared because I, I was so scared of standing up in front of those, um, that class of students. And I thought that they would know. I did. I, I don't know. I don't know. I did. I thought that um, at three and a half years sober, I thought that standing up in front of a room full of 18 year olds as a teaching fellow um, that they would be able to see directly into my eyes and know that I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and all the things that I had done prior to showing up there in front of them. It was terrifying. It was terrifying. It was so scary. It remained scary too. They didn't know. I graduated from that master's course in May. I don't like teaching, so I'm not going to thank you um, for the claps. I graduated over Zoom, by the way, um, which was unexpected. And I don't know what I'm going to do again. I have a little bit of a better idea, but like, but like, I have to try to explain like how everything I, with, with less than five minutes left, I have to try to explain to you guys that everything that happens in my life that's positive or mysterious, right? Or unknown is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything. Left to my own devices, my life would be mapped out in varying degrees of smaller and smaller rooms on various substances um, with my, the actual substance of my life just getting smaller and smaller. And there's zero mystery to that. Um, I, I think I'm right. Always. I think my thoughts are the penultimate authority on everything. AA continues to show me how wrong I am. If AA has the power to do that, 
AA has shown me that there's a power greater than myself, right? That doesn't mean I get to feel good all the time. That doesn't mean that I don't have to feel fear or that I don't have to take actions that I hate. It just means that I know that the type of life that I want to live comes from a result of me doing the steps, going to meetings, working with others, and working with a sponsor in AA. There's no other way to do it. We could sit here and talk about all the ways that I've been wrong. Because if I could give you the opportunity to tell you all the ways that I've been wrong, then you would be able to see all the ways that I've been gifted. I thought that my, based on the things that I did loaded, I thought that my mother, my poor, long-suffering mother would never speak to me again. How wrong. I thought at best, the amends would give us like a friendly relationship. You know, something maybe akin to like what I had when I was, a teenager in high school, like how wrong I was, you know, I am so overpaid and Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, God, I really didn't want to speak here tonight, John, but guess what? I feel better than I do when I started. As long as AA continues to surprise an alcoholic like me, I'll keep coming back. So I think that's where I'll end. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.